enough of a response. Good morning. How are you? All right. Okay. I mean, you got to be like a child entering into the kingdom. I mean, Paul comes in and he asks 90 kids and they explode. Let me try that again. Good morning. There you go. Come on. It's a good day to be in church. We need to be excited about stuff. You know, and the truth of the matter is we've been, we've been talking about how to share the Christian faith, how to share it. We've been sharing it all week. We've been sharing it to the kids that are most likely to give their hearts to Jesus anyways. So I, I'm willing to bet 30, 40 souls were added into the kingdom of God this week. I am willing to bet the number of kids that got information that they will never, ever forget. The reason I know this, and I'm here to tell you, what we're about to cover today about science dovetails exactly with what we taught all week to the kids. And that information is my testimony. The reason I'm a Christian today is because when I was about 12, VBS age, I saw a speaker, Dr. Dwayne T. Gish, give a presentation like I am about to give you. And I have never been the same from that day to this. I point at that. Dr. Gish went home to be with the Lord just last year. And I am confident. I look forward to getting there and saying, Doc, you're the reason I'm here. And there are children in this neighborhood that are going to go to heaven because of the information I'm about to give you, the information that we gave them at VBS, the information that your support allows us to do. That's not small. That's not small at all. That's huge. That's eternal. That's forever. That's important. If I can get this thing to work right. I'm pushing the button. Ah, there it is. Okay. Now, We've been talking about how to share the Christian faith. And this message today, I hope, is revolutionary for you. So, let's begin. Restored. Commander, power online. Mr. Spock, altitude stabilizing. It's a miracle. There are no such things. Engineering to bridge, Mr. Spock. Mr. Scott. Sir, you'd better get down here. Better hurry. So the captain is willing to give his life to save his crew. If you've never seen that movie, I recommend it. It's a powerful film. It's about sacrifice, selflessness, love. Powerful film. But something struck me when I was watching it, and it was this scene, and it's the reason that I showed it to you. Because someone says, it's a miracle. And Spock says, there's no such things. No such things? You see, Spock is the representation in that film, in common culture today, of the, the logical, scientific 
mindset. This is the mindset that says there are no miracles. And you run into this every single day. You run into people that will tell you when you're trying to share your faith with them. You want to tell them how wonderful VBS was. You want to tell them how great your church is. You want to tell them how much Jesus transformed your life. And they dismiss you almost immediately because they say, you can't trust the Bible because there's no such things as miracles. The Bible is against science. Science has proven that the Bible is wrong. And I'm not listening to you. I don't hear you. Because of that argument. Somehow, some way, people get it in their minds because of movies like this. Because of, of a mindset, a, a worldview that we've been training our children in since they were five years old at the public school system that tells you that, that evolution is the truth. That the, that the earth is millions of years old and that you can't trust the Bible because it goes against science. And that argument, you may have noticed, I don't like. I have a little pet peeve against this. It gets under my skin. All right? And one of the reasons that it gets under my skin is because if it is true, if the Bible cannot be trusted about science, if it's wrong, quite honestly, if the Bible's wrong about anything, and you can't trust anything that it says. See, if the Bible is wrong about this, how can you trust what it says about eternity? About things you cannot see because death is something that we all face. But unless the Bible is true and Jesus has come back from the dead to tell us what is beyond, how can we trust it? If it's wrong about science, we can't trust it about eternity. We can't trust it about what is right, what is wrong, about morality. We can't trust it when it says you need Jesus to save you from your sins. How can we trust that if it's against science? Because our whole culture is wrapped around the idea that science is the be-all and end-all of knowledge, that we are rational, that we have reached a point of knowledge as, as human beings that has never been achieved before in the history of the human race, we are better, we are smarter, and that is why our world is so much better than it was 100 years ago. Isn't that right? Just turn on your news, and you will see the only thing we're better at is we can kill more faster. That's what we can do. All of their science, all of their science, all of their knowledge... What does it really achieve? Well, let's take a look. You see, the Bible has something to say about this. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 says this. For the truth about God is known to them, to people, to human beings, to smart people, to scientists, to scientific-minded people, to Spock. It is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created. It does not say evolved. It says created. People have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. God made it, not chemistry. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and the result was what their minds became dark and confused, and claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. Now, what this verse is saying is that every human being can see from real science, from real observation of the universe, of the earth, of everything that's around us, that only God could have pulled this off. Only God could have made this. And any other explanation other than that is just darkened thinking, twisted thinking. Darkened because we don't want to see the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. 
We want to do whatever we want to do, and we're going to try to come up with some scientific justification so that we can continue to do evil deeds. That's really the bottom line. So when you're talking to somebody, and they, they throw up this objection, and I know it's intimidating. In fact, last week, you know, we talk, we've talked in the last four weeks about how to share your faith. Talking about the Ten Commandments, how to, how to get people to see that they've broken the laws of God. Let them admit it, and that brings them to a place of conviction. But they're going to throw up these objections. And last week, we talked about relevance. And the week before that, we talked about how you can trust the translations of the Bible. But one of the biggest ones, the top three is translations, relevance, and this one, science. These are the top three objections, and I wanted to hit them. And when, when they bring this one up, what they're trying to tell you is, my conscience is telling me that I'm wrong before God, but I don't want to listen to my conscience. So I'm going to throw up uh, an objection that everybody in our culture feels is valid. Because we all revere science. We're intimidated by the guy with the white lab coat. We think that somehow scientists are rational, scientists are scientific, and that scientists, um, they're always looking for the cold, hard facts. And that's what it really boils down to. How many of you know that scientists are actually human? How many of you know that humans can be irrational no matter how many degrees they have on their wall? How many of you know that, that scientists can have bias and prejudice no matter how smart they think they are? How many of you know that scientists can be wrong even if they went to Harvard? Okay, they can be because they're human. We need to look closely at these things because the truth of the matter is, now listen carefully to this statement. I've been studying this stuff for a long time. Most of you know I was a science teacher in the public school system at one point, taught both general science and biology. I'm not speaking to you as somebody who doesn't know this stuff. Most of you know I've written two books on this subject. The truth is, the Bible does not contradict science at all, anywhere, period. Now, immediately, I'm, this is on tape, I'm going to get a blistering attack on Facebook in the next three days. And since I'm on vacation, I won't have to answer. But the truth is, I'm going to get a blistering attack. Why? Because immediately, people are going to say, how can you make such a statement? The Bible says that the earth is young. By the way, the Bible doesn't tell you how old the earth is. How many of you knew that? I mean, it is implied when you read Genesis and when you look at the genealogies that are there, even if you allow for gaps, which I do, you still are only going to get the earth being thousands of years old, not millions, and certainly not billions. That's what you're going to find. And they're going to say, that contradicts science. No, it doesn't. It contradicts scientific speculation. <laughs> okay, not science. We'll get to that in a second. And it's going to say, the Bible says that, that God created everything out of nothing. How can you believe in that? That's like believing in magic. What are you going to tell us next, Pat? That magic wands and Harry Potter are real? I mean, I can't believe in miracles. I can't believe in all that stuff because we know scientifically that the earth is actually billions of years old and we know that we got here by a process of evolution. We are all hairless apes of some sort. Over millions and millions of years, all scientists will tell you that over millions of years, these ape-like creatures slowly and gradually became Homo sapien sapien, which you see at the end there. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that not all scientists believe this. There is a very large community of the intelligent design movement right now. These are not Christians. These are not creationists. They're what we call intelligent design theorists. These are people, many of them are agnostic. Some are still atheist. Others are, you know, other faiths. But they're scientists. And they're going, the evidence doesn't add up to that story. I don't buy it. I can't buy it. There had to have been an intelligent designer. I don't know who he is. I don't want to know. But I just know that there had to be one. Now, that's cowardly in my view. And then you've got the creationists who are not cowards. They stand up and say, we know the creator. I know who he is. He, he revealed himself to us in the book of 
Genesis. Okay, so not all scientists believe this story. Now, here's why this is so important to understand. As I said before, it appears from the scientific Spock mindset that you can't trust the Bible because the very first chapter and the very first verse, verse say something that is supposedly against science. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was God that did this. Now, I have reviewed for this congregation many times the evidence against the theory of evolution. I've gone through that. If you're a new visitor, I've given you a copy of my book so that you can read it. And honestly, I don't want to bore you by going over it for the hundredth time. But I will. No, I'm kidding. I'm just going to do a few little points because actually that's not where I want to go today. Because the truth of the matter is, I have learned the hard way that this evidence, while it's important, never convinces anybody. Because people who don't want to be convinced won't be. Jesus himself said that. Look at the Pharisees. They saw the dead raised. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. They knew he was dead. He was in the grave for four days. He smelled dead. He was dead as dead and dead as dead. And they watched Jesus call him forth. They watched him rise from the dead by the power of the word of the living God. They were there. And they were so angry because what this meant was is that Jesus had real authority to tell the Pharisees that they needed to change their lives. And they didn't want to change their lives. So instead of going, wow, let's worship God, they said, wow, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. Let's silence him. And scientists are doing that to this day. The intelligent design community stands up and says, this doesn't fit. Here's why I know it doesn't fit. Look, real science, the word means knowledge. It doesn't mean speculation. It means knowledge. That's what the word means. Now, what that means is scientists are supposed to gain knowledge by observing things, watching natural phenomena of some kind, and doing experiments to see how it works. And then they are going to respond to that by putting out a, a, a hypothesis about a natural law or a natural process. This is how it's supposed to work. And they test it and they experiment on it until they, you know, I mean, if I tell you that water boils at, you know, at uh, um, um, pure water boils at, uh, at uh, 212 degrees, 100 degrees centigrade when you're at sea level. And, and that's what it is. Well, I can experiment on that. I can put it in different uh, containers. I can, I can do all kinds of different things, and I can, I can demonstrate that that is true. That's what knowledge is. Does that make sense? Now, when you're looking at something in the unobserved past, the key word there is unobserved because, you see, real science has to be two things. It has to be observable, and it has to be repeatable, or it's just not science. It's speculation. And I don't care how many degrees they have in the wall. I don't care how nice and white their white lab coats are. I don't care how many times they, they use great big long words like, you know, uh, punctuated equilibrium or, 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 you know, embryologic recapitulation. They use these great big words to try to intimidate you. The bottom line is if you can't observe it and you can't put it in a lab, it ain't science, it's speculation. And when you're looking at the unobserved past, you're talking about things that supposedly happened millions or even billions of years ago. You were not there. You were not there. And you can't put it in a laboratory. Evolutionists themselves say that evolution is supposedly a process that's so slow that you can't observe it. Well, if you can't observe it, it's not science. It's called faith. You have faith that somehow, some way, little changes in creatures have resulted in major changes. You're talking about, um, you know, something like a cat becoming a dog. So somewhere in the middle, you should have a cog or a dat somewhere in there. Now, you find lots of cat fossils and lots of dog fossils. You do not find any cog or dat fossils in the middle. You do not find any transitional forms. In fact, when you look at it in this, you know, when you look at these fossils, they supposedly say you can see this in the fossils. But the truth is, that no one has ever seen one life form completely change into a different life form by any natural process. It has never been 
observed. It's never, you know, we have been blasting fruit flies with radiation for 50 years. And they're still fruit flies. I mean, we've been zapping them as hard as we can. We come out with some two heads and four eyes. and we, you know, they, they really zap them. And they can't get them to turn into mice. Because it doesn't happen that way. There are limits within the variation. People will say, well, you know those finches down there, you know, the Darwinian finches down there in the Galapagos Islands, we, we've seen how their beaks have changed. You know, some of them have beaks for, 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 for insects, and some of them have beaks for seeds. And I always say, well, yeah, but they're still birds, they're still finches, and if you leave them alone long enough, they'll breed back to the center. I mean, that's like saying that I have a nose like this, and somebody has a Roman nose, we must be different species. <laughs> no, we're both still human, and if we breathe long enough, we'll all get, you know, uh, whatever's in the middle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In other words, you look at their supposed examples, the sticklebacks, that's a big one. All oh, the sticklebacks, they, they've, they've evolved. I'm go- well, they're still fish, and they're still sticklebacks. I mean, they keep coming up with these supposed examples that are not examples. No one has ever observed one kind, one life form kind, evolve into another life form kind over any amount of time. Because the fossil record doesn't demonstrate it either. In fact, the fossil record is so sudden and so abrupt that no serious paleontologist uses the fossil record to try to demonstrate evolution anymore. In fact, they had to come up with a new theory. You see, the, the fossil record is so sudden and so abrupt, particularly at the Cambrian expo- explosion. The, the reason that it's so abrupt is because God created everything, but they don't want to believe that. So here's what they believe now. It's a new theory called punctuated equilibrium, which means that, that, that equilibrium means the, the species stayed roughly the same for millions of years, and then because of some ecological pressure, all of a sudden, it evolved very quickly into something else. So quickly, it didn't leave any evidence in the fossil record. Okay, so your evidence is a lack of evidence? <laughs> okay, maybe you need to read your Sherlock Holmes again. <laughs> Whenever you eliminate the impossible, whatever is left, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. And which is more probable to believe. And here's the second point, that no one has ever observed chemistry. Random chemistry ever create life, ever. Now, some of them, oh, well, about the Miller-Urey experiment, you know, and they they mixed around and they blasted it with, and they got amino acids. Uh, No, they didn't. (laughs) Okay, they did not. They got a few random, what we call, um, they're they're not uh, optically pure. Now, I know that's, I'm trying to water this down, okay? <laughs> okay, understand that amino acids exist in nature in a left-handed and a right-handed variety. And in your DNA, all of the amino acids are right-handed. I'm sorry, left-handed. And if you have even one right-handed, it will break the entire chain and it won't work. But in nature, they exist in 50-50. And so these experiments, they produced a few amino acids, but they weren't optically, they weren't optical isomers of one another. In other words, they were unnatural. Are you with me? It's not what would occur in real nature. So it proves goose egg. Nothing. Proves nothing. They have never. Now, if evolution was really true, you should be able to put random chemistry in one of those vials and shake and come up with a brand new life form. But you don't. Why? Because your DNA, listen carefully, and I'm going to move on. Your DNA is based on a code. Your, it has purposeful information in it like a blueprint random chemistry has never been observed real science is something you observe and put in a lab has never been shown to produce information ever and we've been mixing this stuff for more than a hundred years and we still have not come up with it why because it never will it had to have been designed and built from the outside now when you look at those two things the fossils don't show it. it. Well, three things. It's never been observed in the real world, and you've never observed chemistry creating life. Okay, the discussion is, is pretty much over right now. There is no evidence from science that there is any natural way you could get life. 
impossible, could not happen. That's real science because I can observe that, I can experiment on that, I can demonstrate that chemistry will never produce life. Prove it. I've done it. The scientists have done it. They've proven that. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that people have no real excuse to disbelieve in God. They have no real excuse to disbelieve in the Bible because what we actually observe shows us that there's no natural way to explain the universe. No, no, you can't do it. Okay, now, you can bring that up with somebody. You can say, there's no real evidence for this. There's no real evidence. You can show them fossils. You can show them DNA. You can show them chemistry. You can get real sophisticated, and you can learn all the acronyms in my book. Please look it up, F-I-C-T-I-O-N. Get one at the front. Shameless plug. Now, there aren't any more? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, uh, I'll order some more. <laughs> but anyway... The point is, you can, you can memorize all that stuff, and I have. And you can go and present it, and I have. And people will look right at you and go, who cares? Just like the Pharisees looked at Lazarus, and they did not want to believe. So what do I do? How do I deal with that if First Peter says I'm supposed to be giving an answer, and I give all this science, and I give all this information, and they just blow it off? That, you know, I mean, the latest, you know, I, I'll answer people, but they get to the place where, well, you know, we don't know everything, but we'll just keep studying and we'll figure it out. Okay, that's called faith. But they don't want to recognize that either, right? But they'll continue to go, I have faith in science. You have faith in the Bible. And that's really the bottom line. Listen carefully to me. When you're dealing with somebody who's throwing out the objection of science has proven the Bible, what you're uh, proving the Bible is wrong, what you're really dealing with here is a clash of worldviews. You need to understand that you're looking at a clash of worldviews. It's not about science because the Bible doesn't contradict science. Real science says that only God could have created this. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. Real science tells us that. So what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with something, and this is what I want you to try to do, is to try to get people to understand that we're dealing with a clash of worldviews. It's not about science and facts because both creationists and evolutionists use the same information, don't they? They use the same information, the same facts. Evolutionists keep looking for other facts because the ones that we have don't prove their theory. But they're not going to come our direction because it's actually a clash of worldviews. This is what a worldview is. A worldview is a connected set of beliefs about what is real, and what real things are like. It is something in science we call a priori. It's where you come in a priori. You come into an argument. You've already got a connected set of beliefs about what is real. So it's going to color everything you look at, isn't it? If, you're, if, you're, if you have glasses on that are tinted blue, in your view, everything is blue. And from your perspective, that's what's real. Everything is blue. In order to get people to understand where they are, you've got to get them to take off their glasses. You've got to get people, you've got to say, and uh, people love this one in our culture today. You, you challenge them, are you willing to have an open mind? Well, sure I am. No, no, no. Are you really willing to have an open mind? Because you see, there's two worldviews. Listen, here's the first one. The first one is called the naturalist worldview. The naturalist worldview says that the universe is all that there is, all that there ever was, and all that there ever will be. That's a quote from Carl Sagan. The universe is all that there is, ever was, or ever will be. That's the naturalist worldview. In other words, what he's saying is that you have to be able to explain everything using natural forces or natural laws. That's like looking at a box. Guys, look at a, I, I forgot to bring my box with me. I wanted to, to do that to demonstrate this, but I'll just use this. Look at this box here. That's like being inside the box and trying to explain the box from the inside. Are you with me? That's a closed mind because what you're saying is if there's something out there that I cannot explain by a natural rule, a natural law, something like a miracle, Something like the Bible prophesies the future or God created things out of nothing or Jesus turned water into wine. 
Well, I can't explain that with natural laws. Therefore, because of my worldview, it must be an illusion. I won't see it. I won't hear it. I won't even talk about it. Because my worldview says those things cannot be real. I'm Spock, and there are no such things as miracles. Does that make sense? That's the worldview. Now, if you've watched Star Trek long enough, you will find out that Spock's worldview is rather limited. And Kirk is constantly trying to get him to understand that emotions are real things and they have value. You notice that? He's trying to get him to think outside the box. I find that very interesting. Now, here's the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview is that God is transcendent. That means he's outside of the box. He's not inside the box. He's not subject to natural laws because he created natural laws. He is outside the box. And because he is outside the box and created everything inside by his own power, then that does allow for miracles, doesn't it? Because God is outside the box. Now, you've got to think about it for a second. If you're inside the box, how did everything get there? Either everything came inside the box just by accident and nat just natural forces, or somebody opened the box and put it in. Two different ways of thinking about it, right? Now, the biblical worldview says that in the beginning, there was nothing. And God spoke, and everything came into existence by his power. Therefore, all natural laws are subject to his power. Now, that's a completely different point of view. Now, when, you, when you're talking with people, you've got to say, let's, let's talk about this. Let's try to see this from an open-minded point of view because we're actually having a clash of worldviews. You are determined to believe there's no such thing as miracles because you're looking at it inside the box. I'm asking you to have an open mind. Let's take a look, friend, when you're talking to them. What is a miracle really? And what is a natural law, really? And let's see if you can have an open mind when we're done with this discussion. You with me? You ready? This is going to be a journey. You're going to like it. Okay, I'm going to take somebody now from I have a closed mind. I am a naturalist. I don't believe in miracles. And I'm going to help that person move to a different place. The first thing I'm going to say is, let's talk about what is a law. The first thing we need to understand is, that there are different kinds of laws. Human laws, for example, we have the law of the stop sign. Okay. Now, the law of the stop sign says you see the sign and you're supposed to slow down and go through carefully. That's what we all do, pretty much, especially in Arizona. No, you're supposed to stop. That's the law of the stop sign. But can you break the law? Sure you can. You do it all the time. <laughs> you can break the law. See, that's the kicker. Human laws are the way people should behave, the way they ought to behave, but there's choice. You can choose to disobey the law. So that's one kind of law. Now, natural laws are somewhat different. Natural laws... Oh, this is killing me. Okay. Natural laws describe what actually happened in the world. Okay. That's, that's different. See, rocks fall because of gravity. They have no choice. That's a natural law. You do not see rocks beginning to fall and going, wait a second. I don't want to fall. I'm just going to hover here for a little while. Okay. You, you can't do that either. <laughs> okay. You can try. You can step out the window and go, I'm, I'm not going to obey that law. Step out, see what happens. Okay, you can dislike natural law all you want. You are subject to it, like it or not. Does that make sense? That's what a natural law is. And, and that's the point. Gravity works whether we like it or not. Now, here's the kicker, though. There are exceptions to natural law. Now, listen carefully. Why does gravity work? Because things that are heavier then air are pulled towards the earth by the force of gravity. But, of course, we see an exception to this every day. They're heavier than air, right? 
So what's going on here? It seems like we have a contradiction in natural law. Gravity works, things fall, but birds don't. And the reason they don't is because they're using something else. They're using aerodynamics. Now, aerodynamics says that if you have the shape of that airfoil moving through the air, what's going to happen is the air going over the top of the airfoil is moving faster than the air underneath, so you get lower pressure on the top, higher pressure on the bottom, and that creates lift. It contradicts the law of gravity. But does the law of gravity quit functioning? No, because if birds or airplanes <laughs> are moving through the air and they quit moving through the air because their engine quits or they quit flapping their wings, what happens? Gravity. Gravity doesn't stop working just because, now listen carefully, just because there is a higher law. You see, there's gravity, but then there's a higher law, the law of aerodynamics. Now, we don't think that's a miracle because we've discovered how airfoils work. But the truth of the matter is, what we're saying is that God has laws that are higher still. Just like the law of aerodynamics is higher than the law of gravity, so the laws of God are higher than all natural laws. Which is why Jesus could walk on water when he felt like it. Or walk right through a wall. Or appear and disappear suddenly from the road to Emmaus and then all the way back here. Why? Because he's functioning on a law, we'll call it the law of super aerodynamics, which is above even the, our laws of aerodynamics. Now, here's why this is so important to understand. Because you see, 200 years ago, what was this whole idea of human flight? I mean, when you looked at it 100 years ago, I mean, people, people thought of flight as a miracle, didn't they? Because they hadn't discovered the higher law of aerodynamics. So from their point of view, now this is extremely important, 200, 300 years ago, everybody knew humans can't fly. They don't have wings. And that's where you got myths of flying witches. That's magic, right? Or the gods. Because we all know that humans can't fly. Except that we fly, there's airplanes flying every single day. Are humans flying or are airplanes flying? Airplanes are. Humans are inside the airplane. Does that make sense? It, it, um, does that make sense? Are you with me? Now listen carefully to what I'm trying to tell you. Human beings in an airplane are violating natural law. They do it every day. We don't think of it as a miracle because we're just using a higher law. The law of gravity. Then we have the law of aerodynamics. And we human beings went, we want to use that law of aerodynamics. So what do we have to do to get to it? We had to use two important things in order to create our flying machines. We had to do two important things. Now, listen very carefully. We had to use our intelligence and our power, our ability to build something, power. We had to use two things, our intelligence and our power to get around natural law. We don't consider it a miracle because we use those two things, our power and our intelligence. Now, did nature object? I mean, did nature suddenly explode because we were violating natural law? No, the law of gravity still works, <laughs> right? Airplanes crash all the time because the law still works. Now, this is extremely important to understand. Humans use their own power and their own intelligence to build flying machines, that's not a miracle, and yet it is a miracle because it's allowing for something that's unnatural. It's not a nature design system. It's a human design system. Are you with me? Now, this is important because nature does not object. It simply absorbs what we do. It, it just takes it in. Now, I'm, I'm making this point so strongly because we don't think that using a higher natural law to get around a lower natural law is somehow unnatural or a miracle because we used our own power and our own intelligence to make this 
miracle possible. And that's the point, is that God is using his intelligence, which is a whole lot bigger than yours, and his power, which is a whole lot stronger than yours, to use laws that are higher than all natural laws to do whatever he darn well pleases. (laughs) Right? And if he wants to turn water into wine, yes, it's a miracle from our point of view. From God's point of view, it's a piece of cake. Right? I mean, simple, uh, there is a scripture, I, I wish I'd put it up here, I just thought of it, where God says, you know, he challenges people. He says, where, it's in Job. Where were you when I put a plumb line out across the sky? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? I mean, surely you know, says God. I mean, do something simple like create a bird. Go for it. I mean, God is literally challenging people to say, see how tough you are. See how smart you are. See if you can do what I do. You see, all natural laws are created outside the box by God. So if he wants to do something using the higher laws that he has and inject it directly into our reality, what happens? Nature simply absorbs it just like nature absorbs our flying machines and doesn't object at all. See, because people say, oh, you can't believe in miracles because that, that goes, if you believe in miracles, it would destroy all natural law. No, it wouldn't. Just like airplanes don't destroy natural law. Does that make sense? So when God healed somebody, now this is important, those airplanes, if they fly using a higher law and their engine fails, what happens? Lower laws take effect where they never quit taking effect, did they? They're always pulling on that airplane and it crashes. In the same way, when Jesus healed people, it didn't do anything unnatural because every single one of those people is currently dead. Why? Because the laws of aging carried on, just like the laws of gravity carried on. So Jesus healed somebody, and the law of aging never stopped. Nature simply took that miracle and absorbed it, just like it takes airplanes and absorbs it, and things carry on. And that's why those people continued to live, got old, and died. Are you following this? So when you're trying to explain to somebody, you know, how, how, how can you believe in miracles? You say, well, let, let's think outside the box for a second. If God is truly transcendent outside the box, then he will have laws just like we are able to use our power and intelligence to make machines that use a higher law to defeat the effects of a lower law. So God uses his power and his intelligence to do things that are outside all of nature. Now, when you get them to that point, you say, now, the world's greatest physicists are going to tell you that everything in the universe, everything, came from nothing. It just popped into a being. It's called the Big Bang. Everything you see, universes, suns, stars, moons, planets, you, me, birds, bacteria, everything popped into existence 100% out of nothing. Now, wait a second. This means, listen carefully, think about the box again. You are telling me that the world's greatest scientists believe that nothing created everything instantly for no reason. Listen carefully. Using laws that didn't exist. You can't have natural laws when there's nothing because natural laws are something. When there was nothing, there was no law of gravity. (laughs) Are you with me? So if there's no law of gravity, if there's no law, there's no nuclear constant, there's, 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 there's none of these things, you know, what, how do you get everything from absolutely nothing when you have no natural laws to guide it? Natural laws had to come into existence perfectly, instantly. Somebody had to say something. You see, that's called faith. Either you believe that everything in the box came from within the box for no reason 
using laws that did not exist. Because remember, nothing means nothing. Because people try to say, well, you know, because of the law. Wait a minute, because of what laws? Nothing means nothing. Let's get that through our heads here. <laughs> nothing means nothing. So there were no laws. So you either believe in nothing or you have faith in a God that is transcendent outside of everything. And you see, the Bible and the Bible alone describes the God that could create everything out of nothing. Dr. Myers calls this causal adequacy. You have to look at something that created a cause, but it has to be adequate to create the cause. Are you with me? If it's not adequate, how can it make the cause? See, nothing is not adequate to cause everything. However, God, from his own power, is adequate to create everything. And only the Bible, no other religious document on earth, no other ancient religious document on earth, no other ancient document talks about God creating things out of nothing except the Bible. And that fits what physicists have said, that everything came from nothing. They just don't know how. I do. God said, let there be light. Because he's outside the box. See, if you've got a truly open mind, that would all make sense to you. That would all work. And again, we see that people have no real excuse to disbelieve in God or the Bible because only the God of the Bible can, is capable of creating the universe the way we see it. Are you, are you with me? Now, I'm going to go through the next part really quickly because I'm actually running over. Are you okay with that? I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going over, but I get excited about this stuff. But, yeah, sorry. Okay, the truth is, the truth is, the writers of the Bible were the first real scientists. Because everything is real science is something you can observe or repeat in a lab. And they were there. They were either there to witness it or God himself said, this is how I did it, write that down. <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. You see, that's real science. Real observation. Now, this is important. I'm going to go through this really quickly, and it should be in your notes because, like I said, I'm running out of time. But I want to talk about real science. You see, because the Bible actually talked about real scientific things thousands of years before the scientific age. Let me give you an example. The most proven law in all of science is called the first law of thermodynamics. It's called the law of conservation of mass energy. And what that tells you is that there's no new energy being created or destroyed in the universe. It simply changes form. You, energy is a constant. There was nothing, and then boom, everything that we have was there. All the energy in the universe was there from the beginning. Now, nobody knows where this energy came from except for creationists who will say, God gave it to us. It's his energy. He said, let there be light. Okay, well, you can see that in Colossians 1.16. All right, for by him all things were created that are in the heavens and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Okay, the second law of thermodynamics, also one of the most proven laws of all of science, is called the law of increasing entropy. What that means is, is that the universe is becoming rapidly more disordered over time. It is losing complexity. Things are breaking down. Does that make sense? It's easy to see. Park a truck in a field, leave it there for a million years, you will not have a 747. You will have nothing. If you're lucky to have a pile of rust. Okay, you can see this in Romans 8.20. All right, against its will, everything on earth was subject to God's curse. All of creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we all know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In other words, what has happened is, is that death and decay are a curse. Does that make sense? And that fits what we see. Now, the Bible teaches that the earth was round, okay, and that space is expanding, and that was predicted 3,000 years before Galileo. Right here. In these verses... And I'll just quote one, Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out heaven like a curtain and spreads them out 
like a tent to dwell in. It wasn't until just under 70 years ago that scientists discovered that the universe is expanding. The Bible says he's been stretching it out for a long time. We didn't even understand that the earth was round until 1490. Okay, that's not that terribly long ago, guys. We think we're smart. How about this one? The Bible says that atmosphere has weight. How many of you know that we don't think the atmosphere has weight? Because in our human minds, we go, there's no weight here. <laughs> yes, there is. 14 pounds per square inch. We know that now, but the Bible said it in Job 28. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heaven to establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. And that's not the only verse where it says that. And there is others. You know, the Bible teaches that the earth is suspended in space. This is important because other religions tell you that the earth sits on the shoulders of a god or on a turtle. That's what the, uh, the, the uh, Hindus tell you. It's turtles all the way down, guys. Now, Job 26, 7, he stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Now, that was written thousands of years before Galileo. How about this one? The Bible teaches that the stars cannot be numbered and that they are all different. When for centuries, people thought there's roughly 3,500 stars because I can see them and I can count them. And then Galileo shows up. And we find out what? There are trillions upon trillions of stars, and they're all different, different colors. <laughs> the Bible said that in Jeremiah 33, 11, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. And this is just one place where it says that. Now, there's another one. The Bible teaches that dinosaurs were real creatures and that people actually witnessed them. People don't know that, do they? Now, you can find it in all of these verses, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to read one, Job 40, verse 15. I put the others in your, your outline. It says, look now at the behemoth, which I have made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. A cedar is a tree that's 200 feet tall. That's a big tree, which is a very big tail. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit and his bones are like beams of bronze. How many of you know that if you were to run into a Diplodocus tomorrow, it would be big? His ribs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marsh. Isn't it interesting that scientists now will tell you that most of your sauropods dwelt where? In swamps. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brooks surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes or one pierces his nose with a snare. You know, when you read this stuff, and that's just the, the Job's uh, passage, the truth is the teachings of the Bible simply do not contradict Modern science. They really don't. And there are places where the Bible actually precedes the speculations and the, uh, and, you know, the discoveries of science by thousands of years. I just gave you a few examples of that. You can find that in my book, Understanding Why the Bible Can Be Trusted. But here's the key. The Bible speaks about nature with care. It does not fall into superstition and has even anticipated many scientific discoveries by many thousands of of years. And what does that demonstrate to you? It demonstrates that your Bible can be trusted. Let's pray.